Wednesday evening Bible study. Good to have you with us here today. Let's begin with number 588 in your hymnal, My Sins Are Gone. 588 in the hymnal.
tempt me and tries to make me doubt. I say, my sins are gone. You got me into trouble, but Jesus got me out. I'm glad and my sins are gone. They're underneath the blood on the cross of Calvary. As far removed as darkness is from God. In the sea of God's forgetfulness, that's good. That's a fun little song, but they sure could have put it in a little bit lower key. That's pretty high. <laughs> but, <clears throat> again, looking at the words, you ask why I am happy. So I'll just tell you why. Because my sins are gone. Isn't that a wonderful thing to be able to say? Let's go to the Lord in prayer here tonight. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for allowing us to be here tonight. Thank you for helping us to sing these songs, Lord, and for helping us to praise you, for helping us to pray. Lord, we ask you tonight to help us as we study your word together. Guide us and direct us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, just some announcements for you here real quickly. Quarterly business meeting, remember, is next Wednesday evening, so try to plan to be here for that. Uh, ladies' luncheon on April 27th at 11 a.m., uh, you can register there on the Church Connect app uh, or on the slide. There's a little QR code. You can scan that little QR code, and that'll take you right to the registration form just so we know how many people are coming so we can plan for that. And then also on the back table, there are uh, sign-up sheets for Wildwood Ladies Retreat, May 17th and 18th. That's on the ministry table there. And don't forget to be praying for Vacation Bible School. That is going to be here before you know it. I know it's only April. But <clears throat> July is not that far away, so be praying for our Vacation Bible School, all the things that go into that. Um, I know we've been working quite a bit on that and uh, working on a, a skit, thinking about rewriting some of it. So be praying about that, that we can uh, make, some, make some changes to it and make it a little bit, a little bit more geared to our our Vacation Bible School, we have some traditions here, you know, these kind of things that we need to follow. And, and uh, this last year, we started a, what might end up being a tradition. What's his name? Lord Bob? Lord Bob? So we've got to figure out how to fit Lord Bob into this script somehow. I'm not sure how we're going to do that, but we'll figure something out. But you pray for that, that God would be glorified in all that, and that, and that the message of the gospel would be brought forward there. All right, the uh, Wilds songbook now. We're going to go to the Wilds songbook for the last two. So number 118 in the Wilds songbook, The Object of Your Love.
And then number 24, number 24, you are always good. Looking back, I can see your fingerprints upon my life, always seeking my best. There were times when your way would make no sense, but as you said, you have never Oh, 
looking up, I can see your sympathy. I doubt myself, but I'm sure of your love. Lavish grace was poured out at Calvary, securing me to our home above. What a powerful song that is. All right, turn to Acts. Acts chapter 5. I had put on the slide, I don't know whether you were watching that or not, but I would put on there Acts chapter 6, and then as I was studying today, I realized we forgot a part of Acts chapter 5, so we're going to back up a little bit and grab that, and then we're going to uh, head out to next time. Acts chapter 5, we're going to begin in verse 33. Remember the last time we were here, uh, Peter and the apostles, oh, I forgot to say, we were supposed to have a guest speaker tonight. I forgot to tell you why I'm standing up here. <clears throat> he called me on Monday, I think it was, and uh, he came down sick. He's apparently struggling with gout. So uh, he said, I can't move. So I can't make it. And I said, that's fine. No problem. We'll reschedule. Uh, it's a young man from uh, Marietta Bible College. Uh, we were going to be his first church, I think. Uh, so I don't know whether we're going to be, end up being his first church or not, but I told him, no problem, we'll be gentle. It's fine. <laughs> we, we appreciate giving opportunity to these young men. Our young men, we've got, we've got our young men are, are, are stepping up and asking to preach now. So we've had Jeremiah, and I've got two more asking to, to have a chance to preach. So what a blessing that is. We're looking forward to that. I'm going to be working that in. But tonight, you've got to listen to me again. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, Acts chapter 5. As I was saying, uh, they were in the prison. They, they got thrown in the prison for preaching there in the temple. And then overnight, the angel let them out right past the guards. Guards had no clue. And uh, they went back and were preaching in the temple again as the... As the, um, uh, the, the uh, Leaders came together, the council came together, and lo and behold, they brought them without violence to the council. Didn't we teach you or tell you not to teach in this name? And Peter told them, we ought to obey God rather than men. And then he got rather bold with them. The God of our fathers, verse 30, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom he slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior. Excuse me, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. And then verse 33. When they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. They were not happy with Peter, with his forwardness, his boldness. Verse 34, Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had in reputation among all the people, and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space, and said unto them, Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what ye intend to do as touching these men. For before these days rose up Thutius, boasting himself to be somebody, to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves, who was slain, and all as many as obeyed, obeyed him were scattered and brought to naught. After this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing and drew away much people after him. He also perished, and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it. Lest haply ye be found even to fight against God. And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house they ceased not 
to teach and preach Jesus Christ. We began last time talking about persecution, persecution that was going to come on the church. And of course, as we said last time, it, it began with the Jews. That was the, the beginning source of the antagonism against the early church. And so here we have them as they are standing before the council, they are bold before the council, and the council gets really, really upset. They need to be killed. We've heard enough of this vile teaching, this, this vile talk, and they were cut to the heart. They were convicted. Conviction had settled in on them, and they felt guilty, and so they responded in anger. Rather than responding in, in repentance, they responded in anger. Well, here we're introduced to Gamaliel. Now, Gamaliel was evidently a very, very uh, high-level uh, rabbi. He was renowned. He was Saul's teacher, we see. We see that Saul, back in Acts 22, verse 3, uh, talks about studying with Gamaliel. This Gamaliel was the grandson of Hillel, who was famous in Jewish tradition. If you'll recall, you had two schools of thought, generally speaking, two main schools of thought in, in the Jewish system uh, at this time. And, and going on from there, you had the school of Hillel and you had the school of Shammai. Hillel was the liberal. Shammai was the conservative. That doesn't necessarily mean that Hillel was bad and that Shammai was good. But that was their kind of where they were placed. Hillel uh, himself flourished about 37 to 4 BC. He had a son. His, name's, his son's name was Simon. We don't know much about Simon. Simon didn't really make a name for himself. But Simon's son Gamaliel, that Luke is introducing to us here was one of seven men who were given the title Rabban. And I don't know whether I'm pronouncing that right. It's R-A-B-B-A-N. So I think it's Rabban, something like that, a rabbin. Uh, and what that is is, is a, a high-level rabbi. There was only seven of them, apparently, that were given this title. So they were well-respected, well-respected. He, uh, Gamaliel developed... Uh, Hillel's teaching and founded a dynasty of famous men which continued for about four centuries, 400 years. So this school of Hillel uh, continued on for about 400 years. Now, this Gamaliel, there is another Gamaliel. His grandson was named Gamaliel also. But this Gamaliel was called Gamaliel the Old. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be nice to, ha to, to be called Ron the Old, you know, or, <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, this Gamaliel, he was called the Old, so they could tell between the Old and the Young, I suppose, because the grandson obviously was much younger than he was. Um, but <clears throat> he, was a, he was a famous uh, uh, rabbi. Uh, notice what it says here about him had in reputation among all the people. People knew him. They respected him. All right, he was a, he was a uh, as I said, the leader of the more liberal school, one of the two most influential parties within Pharisaism. Uh, the Rabban, one person says it means our teacher, our teacher, whereas rabbi means my teacher. Okay, so do you see the difference between my teacher and our teacher? Uh, much higher honor, uh, apparently, there. Um, the Mishnah, a collection of commentaries on the oral laws of Israel, published towards the end of the second century A.D., contains the following statement about him. Now listen to this statement. Since Rabban Gamaliel, the elder, died, there has been no more reverence for the law and purity and abstinence died out at the same time. Now, obviously, they're using a little bit of hyperbole here, but this is to illustrate to us how respected this man was. 
He was very, very, very respected, very diligent about the law, apparently, very uh, uh, careful with the law, and very well learned in the law. Well, here we see Gamaliel standing up and advocating for these disciples. Now, we don't have any record that indicates to us that Gamaliel ever became a Christian. But here he stands up and speaks with as much wisdom as man can muster. Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what ye intend to do as touching these men. And then he goes back and he gives them some history. Note that that Gamaliel's advice was not based on Scripture. He was not basing his scripture on on God's word. He was basing it on history. This is what we have seen in history. He didn't go back to the scriptures and say, look, this is what the Bible says about the Messiah, or the the law says about the Messiah. Had he been genuine in his seeking of truth, and had he been truly committed to the scripture, you would think, that his counsel would have been a little bit different, that he would have counseled his brethren to humble themselves and examine the evidence for the claim of Jesus to be the Christ, instead of allowing uh, this just to be based on history uh, and allowing them to get all angry and upset, you would think, had he been committed to the Scriptures, he could have gone back and looked and, counseled in a little bit different way. But he didn't. But he didn't. Now, had they gone back to examine this evidence, what would they have found? They would have found that Jesus fulfilled every prophecy as the suffering Messiah. Now, had they done that, had they done that before they killed Jesus, which would have been, you would have thought, a time that it would have been done, Jesus might not have gone to the cross. God had a plan here, and God worked out his plan, and his plan is continuing to be worked out here with Gamaliel. Uh, Notice what happened when uh, he gave this counsel to them. They, whether they actually calmed down or not, I don't know, but what they did they agreed with him. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest happily ye be found even to fight against God. It's an interesting thing that he says there. You want to fight against God? You want to be found to be in opposition to God? Which, of course, what are they going to answer? Well, no, we don't want to be in opposition to God. Absolutely not. So he gave them this advice, and they they agreed to it. So as an unsaved man, God used him to protect these disciples. Now, as he based his advice on human reasoning, on on pragmatism, what's what's effective at the moment, uh, we see that the Pharisees' true authority was not really based in the Bible, because what he's doing is what they've, they do from time to time, if you, if you read through the scriptures, they look at the history of the thing. They look at the, the opinions of the thing. And it ends up being based on what the rabbis said. They base much of their, their belief on what the rabbis said. What, it, what do you think this means? And so they end up basing a lot of this on human reasoning. But that's not how we're supposed to test things. We're not supposed to look at things situations in our life and well my human reasoning says this well what does God say about it should I go to Africa and live in a hut with what did I say on Sunday Uh, a cow a goat 10,000 dung beetles and whatever else I said should I do that well human reasoning answers that question very quickly no I mean that wasn't hard (laughs) Why would I want to do that? I have a nice car. Uh, you know, I have, uh, we have air conditioning here. We have heat here. We don't need uh, 
uh, over there, they don't need air conditioning, or they don't need heat, because it's hot all the time. No, that's easy. But that's not why what we should do when we're trying to make these decisions. We shouldn't pattern ourselves after Gamaliel, even though he was a, apparently a very well-respected, uh, intelligent man. We're not to test things by whether they succeed or by whether they are effectual to produce a certain result, but solely by whether they are true to the Scriptures. Now, thinking about that, whether they succeed or or whether they are effectual, effective to produce a certain result, but solely by whether they are true to the Scriptures. Think about today and some modern examples of things that we in the church consider doing, not necessarily just our church, but, but in churches around. What are some things that uh, people base hu- or, uh, uh, move forward with based on human reasoning rather than what the Bible actually says? Anybody give me any examples? Some things that you can think of? You want to you want to grow a church. You want to you want to pay for a church building. You know, I, I drive downtown Zanesville and I look at some of these old magnificent church buildings and I thank the Lord that I don't have to pay the bill to take care of them, to heat them, to clean them, to repair the roof and all that kind of stuff. But somebody's got to do it. So what kind of decisions are made that aren't necessarily according to Scripture, but rather through human wisdom. Anybody have any thoughts on that? Yes. Bring in worldly music. Okay? Because when we bring in worldly music, what's the thinking? What's going to happen? Bring in people. Yeah, you bring in worldly music, bring in worldly people. Okay? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it can be a good thing. But... What does the Bible say? Yeah. 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 We're not to go in the way of the heathen. What else? Any other ideas? What are the things? Okay, you focus on one portion that is more pleasing to the ear of the Scriptures. You focus on the love of God and And you don't hardly ever talk about hell and judgment. You just talk about the love of God. Well, what does the Bible say? Does the Bible talk about hell and judgment? Yes, absolutely it does. Right? So we want to preach the whole counsel of God's Word. Good. Anything else? Stephanie. Building projects, okay? If you build it, they will come. No, we're not talking about a baseball field here. (laughs) But oftentimes, that's the impetus for a building project. Not because you're full to overflowing and you have to go to three services and the pastor's getting worn out because he's preaching three services on Sunday morning. No, it's, well, we have to have these nice facilities and, and, and it's good to have nice facilities. That's a wonderful thing. But is, is that a valid reason to build a building? I think I have a visitor up here. Hmm. Got, a, got my uh, little friend up here. So, If you don't like stink bugs. <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. What, what about... Um, what about when you're in a denomination and you have certain things that are okay according to the unwritten rules of the denomination? What, what do we do? What do people do sometimes in those cases? They go along with those unwritten rules, right? They go along with those things to to keep people happy in the denomination or in a particular group of churches, all right? There are some things that, you know, um, churches today are doing 
And the reason that they're doing them is because, well, if I don't do these things, I'm going to make that church or that pastor unhappy and that pastor that I look up to unhappy and, and that one's going to disfellowship me because I don't do those things. Is that a reason to do things? No. No. What did, what did Peter just get done telling the Jews? We ought to obey God rather than man. Okay? Sometimes people aren't going to like it when you make a certain decision that's according to the Scriptures. No, I'm not going to go to that place. What do you mean you're not going to go to that place? They won't like it. Perhaps it makes them feel guilty. Perhaps it makes them uh, upset in some way. Sometimes they're walking a wrong way. And you don't want to walk that way. And you tell them, no, I'm not going to do that. And it upsets people. But it, if God says not to do it, don't do it. We ought to obey God rather than men. Now, one thing about his thinking here, as we get back to Gamaliel, one thing about his thinking that we need to, to look at, <clears throat> what is... What is he saying here? This man of, uh, let's see, he talked about Thutius first, uh, had 400 men, he was slain, he, and, and uh, all the rest, as many as obeyed him, were scattered and brought to naught. So this Thutius, whatever he was going to do, uh, caused trouble. Uh, because he was slain, then everybody else scattered, and, and it was brought to naught. Then there was Judas of Galilee, he also perished, and they scattered. Okay, uh, Refrain from these men and let them alone. For this counsel, if this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it. Now, what Gamaliel is assuming here is that error will not prosper. These guys were wrong about what they were doing. That will not prosper. Can I ask you a question? Um, what is... Other than Christianity, what's the largest religion in this world? Islam. Is that of men or of God? Is it prospering? Is Muhammad still alive? No. So it didn't work the same way as it did for these two in Gamaliel's day. Wrong or error did prosper and still is prospering. In 2 Timothy 3.13, flip back there to 2 Timothy real quick. Second Timothy 3.13. When we talk about evil and the prospering of evil, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. What does that tell us about evil in our day today? What's going to happen? It will increase. So if we leave it alone, it's not going to go away. Well, Gamaliel's advice is leave it alone. If it's not of God, it's going to fall away. It's going to it's going to fail. Well, the Bible says evil is going to increase. As he's talking to these people, they have standing before them the disciples of their Messiah. They killed the Messiah. They missed that opportunity. Now they have the disciples of the Messiah standing before them. What happens in 70 A.D.? What? Jerusalem is destroyed. Do you think some of these might have lost their lives? So they have these men standing before them, and then in 70 A.D., just a short time later, Jerusalem is destroyed, and perhaps many of these lost their lives. They lost the opportunity that was standing right before them. Proverbs 27, verse 1. Proverbs 27, verse 1.
Proverbs 27, verse 1. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. What does that tell us about following Christ? When's a good time to follow Christ? Now. Today. Gamaliel said, wait, if it's of God, it'll, it'll flourish. If it's not of God, it'll pass away. Shortly before his death, Benjamin Franklin wrote the following to Ezra Stiles, president of Yale University. As to Jesus of Nazareth, I have with most of the present dissenters in England some doubts as to his divinity, though it is a question I do not dogmatize upon, having never studied it, and think it needless to busy myself with it when I expect so soon an opportunity of knowing the truth with less trouble. He wrote this letter to this gentleman on March 9th of 1790. He died on April 17th. Just over a month later, he died. He thought he could wait until after death to decide who Jesus is, but it was too late. Only in this life can we bow the knee to Jesus Christ in his gospel. So as we look down through his advice, do you think his advice was good? wasn't particularly good for the Jews, but it was very good for Peter and the disciples because it got them off. Okay, they, Remember, they were going to slay him. So God used Gamaliel in his, his pragmatic advice to free Peter and the other disciples. Notice what it says there. When they had called the apostles and beaten them, They commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they didn't get thrown back in jail, but they did get beaten. All right, and I don't know whether that was, you know, a flogging beating, whether they were beaten with a cane, but they were beaten. Okay, this is this is not, you know, today where we let them go and they get to walk out with money in their pocket and a change of clothes. No, before you go, we're going to beat you. All right, the physical, physical punishment was a thing uh, back then. But look at their response. They had been through all this, and you can probably imagine, this was not easy for them. This was a stressful experience for them. It was not, not a, a, uh, a trip to the beach. They came before the leaders of the Jews. They were in jail there for a time. Uh, And then they were were beaten before they were let go. But they were let go. And they were alive. And what did they do? And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. So they faced this persecution, this persecution that perhaps would cower any of us here, into being quiet from now on. But they faced this persecution, and they came out of this persecution rejoicing. Rejoicing because they were persecuted, because they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Are we willing to rejoice that we're counted worthy to suffer shame for the name of Jesus Christ? Our culture today, that would not be normal, would it? That would not be the expected result. But what a testimony it could be. If we suffer shame for the name of Jesus Christ and rejoice for it. And then look at verse 42. What did they do? And daily, where? In the temple. Talk about in your face. Don't ever preach about this man again. 
And what do they do? They come and stand in the temple and they preach about Jesus the next day. Now that's boldness. That is boldness. Daily in the temple and in every house they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. This is the early church. This is the church led by the apostles, guided and taught by Jesus Christ through the apostles. They suffer persecution and they press on. They're thrown in jail and they press on. They're beaten and they press on. People speak harshly to them, and they press on. We have much to learn. We have much to learn as a church. Is it any wonder that these men pray for boldness? Because this is not normal. It's not normal to get beaten and go right back to doing what you were just beaten for. And do it with gusto. But these men did that. What an example for us to follow. What a testimony that they gave. We're going to stop there. That's the end of chapter 5. We'll get to chapter 6 um, the next time. Probably won't be next week. It might be. We won't have a real long meeting next week, so we'll see. But um, that'll be the end of chapter 5, and then we'll, we'll go to chapter 6 and talk about uh, management of this size of a church that they have before them. Let's go to the Lord in prayer here tonight. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for giving us these examples, uh, these examples that show us that the Christian life is not necessarily easy, but it can be exceedingly difficult. But God, these men stepped out in faith anyway. They put aside their natural feelings, their natural desires, and they focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. And they went forward in the, the power and authority that He granted them through the Holy Spirit. God, we thank You. We pray that You would help us, Lord, to have that kind of boldness as we're out and about in our community, as we're speaking to people on the street, as we're speaking to people in the, in the stores, as we speak to our relatives, our family. God, help us to be bold, to speak about the Lord Jesus Christ whenever we have opportunity. We thank you, Lord, for your love for us. We thank you for Jesus dying on the cross. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that dwells within us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, so we have a prayer list on the back of your sheet here today. Again, number of...